and intentional and intentional uh, so that um, so that we have a real effort. And so the way I've envisioned it is a six to eight month process behind closed doors uh, with Portland Police Bureau and some national experts, as well as some retired African American and Latinx officers who can share their lived experience as they travel through uh, being a police officer in that um, environment. Uh, while that's happening, there's a community process because policing isn't the only institution that is built on a white supremacy model. And each of our public institutions have racially disparate outcomes. And so we need to create a space for people to share the generational harm um, and the trauma that people continue to carry based on bad policy, whether that was a, a bad cannabis policy where black people and brown people went to jail for a long time and now white people are making a small fortune um, in the same industry. So uh, we have some other work that we have to do around how laws and policies have had a racially disparate outcome. And so we need to do that as part of a broader conversation. And after the conversation, and I think the most important part, is how do we narrow it down to two issues that we agree to work on over the next two years and then give ourselves measurable outcomes that we can hold ourselves to as we start working on dismantling these systems that were built in a, in a way that does not reflect uh, the robust uh, diverse cultures that we are today. So I'm really excited. It's going to be a long painful process and I anticipate it's an 18 to 24 month process. So I'm, I'm trying to be very transparent. It's not quick. It's not something we're going to just, you know, have a class and it'll be over. It's going to be really hard, painful work. Um, but I believe it's absolutely critical if we're going to really build a community safety for everyone. Other questions? Debbie, please go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Debbie Kay. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty and Representative Dexter for giving us this opportunity to come together and talk. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, you're right. It is long, painful, hard work, and you know more about it than I do, but I'm doing my best to learn. Uh, I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Portland, and I wanted to let you all know we've just completed a very intensive year-long study called Portland Police Bureau Oversight and Accountability. There's the cover. You can, thank you. You can find it on our website, lwvpdx.org. The League of Women Voters works on developing a position by consensus, and we are about to complete that process. So we will have um, a position to share with the community very soon. But it's, uh, I did not work on this study, so I get to say it's really good. And um, thank you, Commissioner, for nodding your head. Uh, there's some very solid research, a great many interviews, a lot of uh, uh, reading. Julie is a league member. Julie, thank you for your thumbs up. So it's a great resource that um, I will stop now, but I wanted to make available to you. Thank you. I've thank been you. looking forward to your report being finalized because uh, I've been partners with the League of Women Voters for 30 years, <laughs> working on these very uh, same issues. So it's a pleasure to know that report's coming. Thank you. And I, I just wanna say that as a member of the Judiciary Committee who doesn't have a background in judiciary, the League of Women Voters and the reports that you put out have been really helpful, balanced and well um, reasoned as well as really well supported with as much data as you have. So thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you for using our work. I want to give anybody else the floor that has a question. If not, I'm moving slowly just in case anybody needs to get to the raise hand function. If not, we can go ahead and move on to our second issue, which is houselessness. And as we touched on earlier, it's very in interconnected with 
everything else that we're talking about this evening. So does anybody have questions or concerns? If not, I can prompt because I was hoping that we could touch on the city of Portland and the decision to restart homeless camp sweep. Um, I think that uh, it'd just be interesting to hear. I, I was just going to say Representative Dexter didn't tell me how shy her constituents are because I never have a problem getting people to ask me questions. Uh, yes, let's talk about, well, let's talk about what we as a council agree on. Uh, what we as a council agree on is that uh, we must use as uh, we must use um, uh, trauma informed practices when we are uh, attempting to relocate people who are houseless and we have no adequate place to send them. Um, and and as a council, we thought that what we did was prioritize when would be the most appropriate time to go in and bust up a camp, knowing that uh, we it'll be a long time before we have enough housing that people can afford to live in. Um, needless to say, I was a bit shocked when I read the Oregonian article that Sam Adams was having conversations with lawyers about relocating houseless people downtown. Uh, because there's this theme that if we make town, if we if we make town downtown look pretty, uh, that magically tourism will come back and big conventions will come back. And the reality is that's just not the data just doesn't prove that. What the data shows is that conventions will be the very last thing that comes back. That uh, 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 tourism will be a very slow recovery. Uh, and what we know is that we have a population that is economically devastated because of the last 14 or 16 months. Um, and so uh, it feels like we have a tale of two cities. We have one city that wants to just flip a switch and go back to pre-COVID days as if nothing significant has changed. And then we have another uh, 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 thought process that we have people that will need significant assistance as we work through the biggest economic downturn in the history of this country. And we have to be intentional about how we provide support, whatever level that is, where we can. Um, and so this is a conversation I have all over the city of Portland, no matter who I'm talking to. Because the reality is it's going to take all of us to help us on the path to providing safe housing that people can afford to live in. My biggest shock since being on a city council is what we call affordable housing. Uh, we have this multi program that we uh, jump up and down and say it's fabulous that uh, requires developers to add a few quote unquote affordable units. But let me tell you, uh, does anybody know what the median family income is in the city of Portland? Uh, Debbie does, but Debbie's uh, with the League of Women Voters, so of course she does. But I'm not going to. Uh, anybody else want to guess? I'm going to guess 32,000, but. I... <laughs> oh, Julie, you're behind at times. I am. The median, the median I'll double that and add six. I'm sorry? Uh, 70? The median family income in the Portland metro area is uh, is eighty seven. I'm sorry, seventy five thousand dollars. So that's a that's the median family income, which means half the people make less and half the people make more, right? So when we build what we call affordable housing in in Portland, especially with this multi program. Um, we build housing at typically 80% of the median family income, which means that you have to actually make uh, $60,000 to qualify for our low income unit. I know many uh, families that work two and three minimum wage jobs that don't make $60,000, so would never qualify. And most of those are not actually family units. So, and that's another conversation. So 
So the reality is, is that we have allowed people to talk about affordable housing without actually saying affordable for who? And how much do I need to actually, how much money do I need to actually be able to live comfortably? And I am taking a long time to answer this because I think it's really important for all of us to know what we're up against, right? So it's not just affordable housing, but it's affordable housing at 60% and below the median family income that we desperately need. And most for-profit developers aren't that interested in building at that income level. And so, uh, as far as how do we address the housing issue, I'm currently identifying land owned by governments. I've reached out to TriMet and Metro and Multnomah County. The city has asked all its bureaus to identify land that uh, these governments own with no plan to develop over the next five to ten years. Because we should start using land that government already owns and create self-managed camps all over the city of Portland. What we know is camps, self-managed camps, don't get calls for police service. They don't have garbage piled up outside. And I'm not suggesting that we mandate people in those camps, but I think if the more we can make people comfortable as we continue to build housing people can afford to live in, the, uh, the less trash, the less anxiety to less conflict with housed and unhoused people. Thank you. That was a lot. But it, it <laughs> I was... think that there's one clarifying question here in the chat, which was about the affordable housing thresholds and if that is a maximum or a minimum, the 80% of the median that you're mentioning. So it's a minimum, but no developer does anything without a benefit to themselves. So even for this tiny bit, uh, developers get a tax break on those particular units uh, for, it's not a long period of time and it's not a lot of money. Uh, and the units stay affordable for 99 years, right? So there's some benefit. But the more questions I ask, especially since there's no mandate on bedroom size, as an example. So I've seen three bedrooms with 20 more square feet than two bedrooms. And I went, so how do people live in a bedroom that's only 20 square feet, right? How does that happen, right? Um, but again, it's because it's for low-income people. Those criteria had not been written into the law. Uh, we're upgrading it and we're changing it, but um, there have been a lot of questionable, quote-unquote, affordable housing units that have come across the city council uh, tables in my time at City Hall. If I can just jump, yeah, I'm going to just jump in really quick and, and on the housing um, questions. I think that, um, Commissioner Hardesty, one of the things that I'm really hoping that we can establish, not just with this town hall, but moving forward, is um, a, a really significant dedication to collaboration across the different levels of government. You know, my my constituents or your constituents are, you know, Commissioner Myron's constituents, you know, we have um, people who are suffering and we all agree that we have to address this issue with compassion um, and, and trying to restore dignity for folks and, and what that looks like is a lot of barriers, um, even with this unprecedented amount of money that is coming in for housing, I am concerned, as I know many of us are, that yeah. people won't be able to access it because of the different um, issues with with this. And I know- well, Here's the issue. The, the issue is really simple. There's a different philosophy. The city of Portland has been putting $40 million a year into the joint office because we believe we were partners with Multnomah County and providing housing for our most uh, needy uh, community members. Um, and, um, and I think we've been really good partners. The good news is the IGA is up this year uh, because last year I refused to extend it for three years because I could see the inequity in how we were able to control the dollars that our general fund dollars for the city of Portland, right? So our, our only flexible dollars, so we're giving $40 million. And every time I'd ask questions about, well, why aren't you opening more shelter beds? 
the response would be, well, that's a county decision. And so now I'm at the point where it's, well, why are we giving you money if every decision is being made by Multnomah County and Multnomah County is saying, well, we have these tables that are advising us and it's like, but we give you $40 million. Doesn't that actually count for something? Don't we get to actually direct how those dollars are spent? And what we've heard from the chair is their priority is permanent housing that people can afford to live in with support services. I don't disagree with that, but it's not an either or, it's a both. The public expects us to use those new dollars to help with people who are on the street today, not 10 years from now when we can put them in a house that they can afford to live in. I think that that, so that is a philosophical disagreement between two governments who have an obligation and a responsibility to address this issue. Um, and every time, uh, the uh, COVID is a perfect example. The first new beds that were added uh, during COVID were the outdoor uh, CP30 spaces that my office advocated for because the joint office kept uh, expanding uh, the space because of the CDC space requirement of six feet, but not adding one more bed. And they wonder why houses people are congregated in Old Town. When everything in the city shut down, we left houseless people to fend for themselves. And that was criminal. And that's why there are so many houseless people camped on the sidewalk downtown. Not because there was any um, logic to it, but that was the place where people knew they could get a meal, at least, and support from other people who were houseless. So, um, so the solution isn't just sweeping people out of eyesight so that we can look like we got it going on. The secret is to, to be compassionate and roll our sleeves up because this is hard for all of us, housed and unhoused. And it's gonna be that way for a while. Without federal intervention, without significant resources to back pay mortgages and rent from the federal government, we're gonna be overwhelmed with houseless people uh, by June 30th. Yeah, and that's that's the exact conversation we are having at the state level. Um, and certainly, you know, the crisis is going to come when the rent moratorium ends. Um, and there's a lot of funding and, and we are doing good work trying to make it more accessible. And yet I st still think that, um, you know, I have patients with substance use um, disorder and mental health challenges and, and navigating our social services networks are, is not straightforward. Mm -hmm. And when you're stressed and under, you know, immense pressure, both physically and, and mentally, um, we have to do better with outreach and really investing in those social um, services. So I appreciate your, your perspective on compassion and collaboration. And I just will, you know, double down on it. We've got until September 31st to spend um, a huge amount of, I think it's um, $500 million is uh, effectively, and I may be wrong on that exact, I know that we have that, I just am not sure it all expires September 31st, an enormous amount of um, funding, and we've got to figure out how to get it out the door. Yes, and into the hands of people who desperately need it, right? Um, that's what we have to do. Thank you both. I'm going to jump in and give uh, Casey Lewis, the floor, who has been waiting very patiently to ask a question. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, my name is Casey Lewis. Uh, I am the managing attorney for the Mental Health Rights Project with Disability Rights Oregon, um, appearing today just in my personal capacity as a constituent of Commissioner Hardesty's. Um, wanted to give both of you a shout out for recognizing um, homelessness and public safety uh, as being so tied up in issues of untreated mental illness, untreated disability, um, particularly Commissioner Hardesty, really appreciate your push for the uh, creation and the full funding of the Portland Street Response Program, uh, which we really believe is going to save the lives of the people that we're advocating for uh, who need treatment and not police. Um, and uh, really, uh, really appreciate the fact that you have been out there fighting a not not too easy fight uh, to get that conversation turned in a different direction. Um, so I know with both of you, uh, as I've been following your work as well, uh, Representative, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here. Um, and as a big fan and friend of your predecessor, 
Representative Greenlick, uh, really appreciate that you've been carrying on a lot of his work in the issue of social justice and public health, um, but just really want to encourage all of our elected officials to continue to recognize that sort of the behind the the flashy problems of people thinking that our downtown isn't pretty enough uh, and thinking that we have too much crime, uh, the real problems that are causing all of these things are the fact that we are not providing the services that people need, uh, particularly in terms of mental health and their disability. Um, and those people are ending up on the streets where we've seen that uh, the police contact them repeatedly, often with tragic results. So. Uh, appreciate that you both have recognized that and I definitely encourage you to continue continue in that direction because I think that uh, we're going to go nowhere if we don't. Thank you, Casey. And Commissioner, I'm going to jump in really quick because that really brought up something that hit home um, really deeply for me when I was talking to some of our police officers and, and firefighters. There is um, compassion fatigue that occurs when the same folks, um, you know, are calling 911 or are needing assistance or have mental health crises and no response. And so um, the Portland Street response is really a huge um, opportunity for us to give support and, and decriminalize um, the mental health and, and the um, economic issues that people have. And, and it also is something that I'm hearing from our first responders that they need to be able to go fight a, fi a fire and not, you know, come to the same person's, you know, corner that they've called them every day for the last 25 days at. Um, it's not a good allocation of resources and it certainly is not, you know, what we as a community should be finding as an acceptable result. So thank you for your work on, on the street response. I appreciate that and I just want you all to know that I have not given up on funding, fully funding the pilot of Portland Street Response uh, when we take our final vote in June. Um, and I want to remind you last year in May we thought we had completed our budget vote uh, and in fact in June we opened it up and made some significant changes to our budget and redirected. Uh, 4.3 million uh, to Portland Street Response. Um, I um, am very frustrated that my colleagues, uh, three of my colleagues got together and decided that uh, that Lynch should only be the only community that has access to Portland Street Response as a pilot. Um, had they de uh, actually picked up the phone and talked to me or Chief Boone, we would have told them that this was a three year long process uh, from the ground up, informed by uh, focus groups with police, with service providers, with people who were experiencing houselessness, with surveys, with business communities, et cetera, et cetera. I would have told them that it has been uh, built with an evaluation uh, from the very beginning to see what worked and what didn't work. And the plan was to have six vans in different parts of the city, different times of day, because what I know is you cannot develop a citywide program based on your experience in Lentz. Lentz is a unique neighborhood uh, that is very condensed uh, in a very uh, small um, geographic area, and it has almost no social service supports there. Um, so what we would do in Lentz isn't the same thing we would do, say, in Gateway. Uh, or in Northwest. Um, so uh, I was just really, really, really disappointed that my uh, three male colleagues decided that they would jointly do a press release and go on this tour to say that Portland Street Response wasn't ready. And I've talked to each of them individually since then, and they just didn't have the knowledge to make the decision that they made. Um, but, you know, we are talking men with egos that may or may not see the error of their ways. But I do think with your help um, and with some advocacy, uh, this June could be like last June was, where we did what we thought was impossible as a city council. Uh, but it goes to show, I think, it is a clear example of how women, and especially women of color voices, are um, ignored. Uh, or minimize uh, when it comes to making decisions uh, that are going to have an impact um, on our community. 
This is the very first change in our first responder system in over 100 years. Um, we have to do it right and we have to do it in a way that's intentional. So I was a little annoyed, uh, but um, I have, again, I've not given up. Uh, and if not June, uh, the fall bump is right around the corner uh, and that will be another opportunity. I don't think we should miss the opportunity to really weigh what works and what doesn't work. Uh, because what we know is that sending a sharpshooter uh, to a, a mental health call is absolutely the wrong first responder uh, to that incident. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. We were, we were looking forward to hearing about the Portland Street response, so thank you. Patricia, I want to give you the floor. Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty and Representative Dexter. Um, just a question, I'm thinking about um, homelessness as well as public safety and disasters. What are your thoughts about regional plans and regional approaches that might be opportunities? I, I think of when we had the wildfires and Clackamas and Multnomah were not working together. What are your thoughts about how we might look to solutions and opportunities regionally? That's a really great question. Um, one of the places that I get to work on a regional level is at the, uh, the disaster policy coordinating uh, table um, because of my uh, role at the city with fire and rescue, I, I have a seat on that table. And that's where uh, we meet regionally to actually compare um, our, um, our uh, coordination around disaster. I will say one of the highlights, and you know, if you can call a year like COVID a, a year with highlights, one of the highlights was seeing how well um, coordination centers work together. Um, uh, I know that Multnomah County and the city of Portland worked really incredibly well together, whether it was coordinating uh, food delivery. Um, with, uh, be, prior to COVID, I think we could name four to six culturally specific organizations. Today, we can name 144 that are providing direct services to community members, um, regularly. Uh, we couldn't do that before COVID. So some incredible stuff happened around coordination that we can't lose, right? We have to continue those, that communication and that coordination because uh, food insecurity is the second biggest issue in our community uh, and will be um, in uh, the foreseeable future behind housing um, insecurity is food insecurity. If I can just jump in, um, I was at the Sunnyside Hospital uh, through the wildfires um, Labor Day weekend, and you know we were on red alert, being um, really close to having to evacuate the hospital, which is a logistical and operational nightmare, literally. Um, and I was so grateful for the collaboration that we were seeing. We saw the TBFNR firefighters out in Clackamas County. We had firefighters from Montana and Idaho and people coming from all the region. So I do think, and, and maybe it's labor uh, related, maybe it's um, just people putting on their boots and coming to help, but I really felt the community spirit and yet, what we didn't have was um, a clear, um, a clear level of authority and, and delegation of that authority in some regards. Um, you know, we we lost some fire commissioner. You know, there were some leaders that were, you know, stepping out um, right at the most critical times. And so I think that we need to have redundancy as well as clarity around our leadership and make sure that we have those worst case scenario plans so that we aren't kind of making it up. You know, we've learned through COVID that you know making it up um, as you and go along. Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't. <laughs> Not uh, <laughs> but on the other hand, I have to say, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are areas that we can improve, uh, but I don't think anybody anticipated a year ago, March, that the disasters would be so, so many and so consistent and for such a long period of time, right? It's one thing when you have a plan to address like an earthquake, right? Or 
uh, some other a disaster. But when you have a disaster on top of a disaster on top of a disaster, um, and I have to say, I was never prouder of Portland Fire and Rescue because it wasn't a matter of if they were going to go. The question was how many teams could we send and how did we make sure that we were covered back home in case something else happened, right? Um, the same was also true with COVID. I mean, fire is the first one out there giving COVID shots to the most vulnerable people in our community. So what I've seen from people and those kind of first responder situations has been rank disappears, uh, um, city, county that you report to disappears. It's like, how can I help? What do you need? Um, and um, that's what I, that I'm going to take that with me for a long time to come. Just the incredible humanity that people have shown to each other. Uh, and I don't disagree with the, with the representative that uh, we have to build on that and we have to put systems in place because uh, disasters aren't going to be fewer. <laughs> and in fact, they're going to be much more complicated. So I think we've got a lot of positive learning uh, that can make us better for what's next. Thank you both. Oh, Representative Dexter, do you want to say something? No, I was just going to say, you know, it, it, we are not overwhelmed with um, questions coming at us. So I know I'm shocked by that. I'm like, was it something we said that we scare people at the beginning or what? I know some of these faces and I know they don't scare easily. So I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed that we don't have more questions or maybe it's just as money and people are exhausted. I see Julie's hands up. Sure, yep. I'll just put this out there. Um, how do you, um, what are your thoughts about why um, we in Northwest Portland are now not seeing um, the, the so-called anarchist um, folks showing up on Fridays or Saturday nights? Um, or in my neighborhood, all the plywood is down fine, you know, it was still coming down just a couple days ago. I mean, it's been right. up a long time on a few of the banks. Um, and it's really good to see that. Um, but you know what, but I think we're all still a little anxious. And, and any thoughts? What's the you know, what, what's your inside story on what has changed? And can I mean, and I, I want to make it clear that um, there, we have many problems and, and I support people protesting and rallying against many things, including our white supremacist history. I'm not, I'm not um, arguing about that, but in terms of random, um, what I would call violence um, and things that are happening, what are your thoughts about that it feels at least where I am a little quieter? Well, um, let me just say that, um, you know, as a kid, when I was first learning about uh, civil rights, I was truly in a Malcolm X camp, right? You hit me, I'm going to hit you back, right? And it wasn't until I got into my 30s that I really appreciated um, the, uh, the philosophy of nonviolent uh, direct action. Um, and not only did I appreciate, I really started to understand kind of the teaching and, you know, and it's not easy. It's not easy to be a nonviolent person when violence is coming at you. Uh, and, it, and, it, and so I learned, right? So I moved my own personal perspective. Now, as far as the uh, uh, continuous vandalism all over the city of Portland, um, I continue to ask this question. If there was a group of 20 to 30 black kids running around town, busting out windows and doing graffiti all over the place, do you really think they would not have been identified, arrested and prosecuted? The fact that we know these are 20 to 30 white suburban kids that think it's fun to come down and destroy property um, and then blame it on a movement that they aren't a part of and have nothing to do with. Um, is just, um, it's ludicrous, right? It, it just, uh, right? Uh, the police job, they only have one job and that's to solve crime. And so I just find it fascinating that three kids have been able to wreak havoc on a city for over a six to eight month period of time and they just can't seem to be able to identify them. 
Um, I don't. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe they want to identify them, because honestly, I when the community is scared, the community demands more police, and when they demand more police, they get more resources. I continue to hear we just don't have enough officers, and I'm like. Well, you have 600 officers, and yet you tell me you only have 200 that are available for patrol at any given time. Do the math. Why would that be? What are the other guys doing and gals? What are they doing, right? Um, so I don't buy the premise that they don't have enough officers. I, what I do know is that the way they deploy them actually doesn't serve a public safety purpose. Right, so as and so, which is why getting doing away with specialty units, uh, doing away with the uh, the school resource officers, the transit police, and the uh, gun violence reduction team provided forty four officers that then could be on patrol. But you've never heard that from the police because they're just like they cut our budget. Now we can't do anything, and that's not the reality. But until we go through the process I laid out earlier, I'm just not willing to invest money in a broken system. We have to know what we want to buy before we invest more dollars. I'm going to invoke um, our chair of the Judiciary Committee, um, Representative Bynum, when she says sunlight is um, the best anesthetic. Yes. And, you know, I think that that goes on both sides. Um, you know, we we need to find out who these folks are, and and understand you know what it is that they are part of, and, and get to the bottom of it. And I have understood that there are some you know informants in different ways that they have been able to break up the group a bit. Um, I share your surprise, um, especially on the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder yesterday, that we didn't see a lot more. Um, you know, action or, or protests even. So um, I don't know if it's that people are tired or that they've actually gotten to the bottom of some of this. I suspect it, we'll see it again. Um, and I, I, I do think that there are questions about how our police officers and, and our city, you know, whether it's the district attorney or, you know, others are responding um, to this challenge. And um, I think transparency is one of the best ways um, to hold people accountable. And I hope that the actions that we are taking at the state level to increase transparency will have impact and it's not gonna be immediate, but we are um, definitely trying to do what we can to just, you know, not in judgmental sorts of ways, but we need to be able to know what's going on and who's a part of the, the different, um, evaluations and, and you know we are not doing so well um, with the outside evaluations that we have right now there's a lot of concerns and so Portland is under a lot of pressure right now and so it's an interesting time to kind of have all of this coming to a head and so Commissioner Hardesty I, I appreciate your perspective on this and if you have anything else I'd, I'd love to understand because I don't have any line of sight at the city level what's happening here. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, complicated factors, and you're right, you brought up the Department of Justice Settlement Agreement, um, and you saw the outrageous responses that Portland Police gave to the federal government uh, in response to the protests last summer. Well, we think these kids were just bored, right? They were just got tired of sitting on the couch, and that's why they came downtown. No analysis of what the moment in time was why people in Portland protested for 147 days straight. Um, no analysis of whether they needed to make any changes as a culture, as a institution. Uh, just basically, you know, uh, so yeah, we were late on our reports and our investigations, so just give us more time. Very lackluster. I was shocked to learn that no one inside City Hall prior to recently actually reviewed what the police bureau sent to the DOJ uh, Civil Rights Division or what the auditor sent to the DOJ Civil Rights Division. I said to my colleagues, well, these are the only two entities that were opposed to a truly independent police oversight board and that the elected leaders don't get the way in uh, before they send some outrageous nonsense to the DOJ. Um, so I've developed a process whereby that won't happen again. But again, if somebody's not paying attention and really following all the different pieces, 
uh, it's very easy for the system to revert back to status quo. One thing I want you to know, though, is that I am the co-chair of the Local Public Safety Coordinating Council. There's one in all 36 counties, and their task is to reinvest dollars from saving money of, for sending people to prison. Um, and uh, we're just at the beginning of starting a, um, a, a, a relaunch process of looking at how all the pieces are impacting um, the outcomes that we're receiving. So for example, if we're gonna have less Portland police because we've decided as a community we're not arresting people for misdemeanor crimes anymore, then that means we need less assistant DAs uh, prosecuting misdemeanor crimes, which would mean we would need less sheriffs because we're putting less people in the jail awaiting for a, a trial. So, which means that the hundreds of millions that we're investing now in a broken criminal justice system could actually be reinvested in community solutions and community programs. I'm working on that with Chair Kafuri from Multnomah County. Um, and again, we've just launched it, so we're at the very beginning phases, but I'm impatient. I, I tell people I'm old. I'm not gonna be here for 20 years, uh, and, but in the time I'm here, I wanna change systems so that the systems work for us all. Um, and that's the way we have to do it, right? It's, it's like there's no one easy fix, because if it was, we'd have fixed it a long time ago. But it's looking at it systems why, and figuring out where do you plug the hole here? Where do you plug the hole here? Where do you shine a flashlight here? Um, and I think the partnership between the legislature and some of the incredible bills they've been able to move this session, and some of the the local uh, visionary leadership that's moved us to where we are in the city of Portland, we're on the right track. Uh, but it's very easy to be sidetracked by uh, by press. Uh, releases and, uh, and and fear tactics. I'm gonna jump in here with about two minutes left. Phil, do you want to ask your question? And is that it? Two minutes? <laughs> yeah, it went quick, didn't it? Time goes fast yeah. when you're having fun. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt Commissioner Hardesty. Um, so um, this is a question for Representative Dexter, and it kind of follows up on what we I discussed in the chat a little. So to con provide context, uh, a year ago, the U.S. Supreme Court held that convicting somebody criminally with a non-unanimous jury violated the U.S. Constitution. Last week, it held that that decision did not apply retroactively. That is to somebody who does not, who's already, <clears throat> whose direct appeals uh, have been exhausted. That is, they raised the issue before the Supreme Court decision came down a year ago. Ellen Rosenblum, Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum has made a, has asked the legislature to, to create a, a set of rules to, free people who have been convicted but don't have any right to appeal in court. Um, and the question I'm gonna to ask today is, do you have any sense of where the legislature stands on that issue? Yeah, thank you, Phil. And um, because I have one minute and then we have votes going on um, about this, what I will say is that the attorney general and I have been um, talking quite a bit. And she really does believe that the legislature needs to weigh in on this. Um, it is true that district attorneys may be able to um, retry some of these cases. However, um, many of those um, folks are um, not in a space where by our current statute um, that can happen. So the, the legislature needs to expedite or, or facilitate that. It is also the end of our session. And um, uh, reform of, of such things doesn't go easily. And so at this point in time, I don't believe that we will be taking um, 
statutory action. However, I do know that the Attorney General has requested um, informational hearings to discuss this, and I have every confidence that, that we are planning on doing that. Um, and I'm so sorry to, to move, but I, I did promise um, our chair that I'd be back right on time because I have many um, bills to vote on. So I'm so grateful for all of you coming. I hope we'll have you and, and many more next time. And Commissioner Hardesty, such a pleasure to have you and thank you for your work and your leadership. Um, with that, I'm so sorry, but I'm going to run. Back at you, Representative. Go do you. It's, it's fabulous. Uh, and let me just thank everyone for coming tonight. You know, I, I, I know that we will rise to the occasion if we know what it is we are being asked to do. And I, I am hopeful that we can uh, paint a picture of a more, uh, a more just, a more equitable, and a more transparent city coming out of this pandemic um, because uh, we cannot afford to leave anybody behind. We did not write the uh, history of Oregon, but we do get to write the next chapter. And the next chapter, I think, is going to be the best one yet. So I appreciate you coming out. Thank you so much for being with us. And Lauren, you've done a fabulous job. See you all later. Be safe. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.